The Bible teaches us that we are all descended from the first two people God created. We're all descended from Adam and Eve. You can go a little farther in Scripture past Genesis 1, and you'll see that we're actually descended, all of us, through their son Seth, and ultimately through Seth's descendant, Noah. But if we're all descended from Adam and Eve through Seth, and then ultimately through Noah and Noah's family, then why, when we look at the world today, do we see such a diversity of race and such a diversity of ethnicity around the world? Hi, folks. This is Andy, the analytical preacher. And actually, the Bible answers this question very early in that same book in Genesis. After the Bible narrows down the population of the world, so Cain killed Abel so that Abel was not able to have children and Cain's people ultimately die in the flood. But through Seth, a descendant comes, Noah, Noah's wife and his sons and their wives are taken on to the boat. And then after the flood of Noah, the families, Noah and his family begin to repopulate the earth. And so again, we would say we are all descended from one of Noah's three sons, who was ultimately from Seth, who was ultimately directly from Adam and Eve. But as soon as the flood is over, and as soon as the families of Noah begin to repopulate the earth, we read in Genesis chapter 10 what Bible scholars usually refer to as the table of nations or the list of nations. I'm not going to read Genesis chapter 10 on this podcast. It's long, and it's just a list of names about this person gave birth to that person, and this person gave birth to that person. If you have not read Genesis chapter 10, or if you have not read Genesis chapter 10 lately, you should read it. It's fascinating reading. It's a very important part of the Bible because it helps us see how the Bible explains the world that we live in today. So in this chapter 10, we see a list of Noah's basically grandsons and great-grandsons, and they are listed out, they are described in Genesis 10 as the father's of different nations or different groups of ethnic people or of different races. There are actually 70 different nations, 70 different subgroups that are listed in total. As you read through Genesis 10, it's interesting because I think in some cases, the writer is giving the name of the son or the grandson. In other cases, it almost seems as if the writer is giving the name of the territory in which the person ended up. So it's a little bit confusing in a sense. But Noah had three sons, Japheth, Ham, and Shem. And as you read through, again, Genesis 10, you see Japheth, 14 separate nations are listed. And it speaks about where these individuals go. It speaks about the direction they they go, where they end up. And so Japheth's sons seem to become the ethnic groups in what we would call Europe, both Western and Eastern Europe. In Russia, they become the Persian people uh, who would live in Iran today, and folks on like the Indian subcontinent, India, Bangladesh, etc. Ham's folks are listed, uh, 30 separate nations are listed there, and the sons of Ham, the grandsons, of Ham become ethnic groups in Africa, Egypt, Ethiopia, Libya, Kush. Those are specifically listed out as places in Africa. They become the heads of the Babylonians and various Asian ethnicities that we would recognize today. Shem is the father of 26 separate nations. One of them is the Hebrews, or the Israelites, or the Jews, from which Jesus obviously ultimately comes. And the sons of Shem were also fathers of nations like the Assyrians, which are spoken of frequently in the Bible, and all the various sub-ethnicities that make up the world's Arab-speaking people today. So if you just read through that, it'll say, Genesis 10, the sons of Japheth were, and it will begin to name them, and then it will say, Maybe they traveled in this direction or they ended up in this area of the world. It'll give you a name of the country they settle in, etc. And as it goes through each of those three sons of Noah, it ends that their little sub part of the chapter this way. So for Japheth, it says this in Genesis chapter 10, verse 5. From these, the coastland people spread to their lands, each with his own language, by their clans 
in their nations. You get to Genesis chapter 10, verse 20, and it says of Ham, these are the sons of Ham by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations. You get to Genesis chapter 10, verse 31, and of Shem, it says, these are the sons of Shem by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations. And the very next verse, Genesis 10, 32, wraps up the entire chapter, Genesis 10, saying this, These are the clans of the sons of Noah, according to their genealogies in their nations, and from these the nations spread abroad on the earth after the flood. So the Bible tells us that Noah had different sons, and that these individuals ended up traveling off in different areas and starting their own nations. Now, it mentions here that they each had their own language. We get the catalyst for why they spread across the earth, and we get where the different languages came from in the following chapter. And so what Genesis is saying is, this is where the sons of Noah ended up. These are the nations and the peoples and the geographies that the sons of Noah populated, and they each ended up speaking a unique language, each of these nations or lands or ethnicities of people. Then the writer of Genesis, who was Moses, then the writer of Genesis says, now let me tell you why they ended up scattering and having different languages to begin with. Let me read just a few verses from Genesis 11. Be very familiar to folks. It's the Tower of Babel story. Genesis 11 verse 1 says, now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come. Let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth and they left off building the city. So we know what happened. They decided God had told mankind to subdue the earth and to fill the earth, to be fruitful, and to multiply, and to fill the earth, and to subdue it, and have dominion over it as you're filling it. The people said, we'd rather go our own route instead of God's way, and gather all of us here together. And so God said, I will forcefully scatter you out, and in the process, give you each a different language, so that you can't just run right back together and start right back up again. And so here's what we know. And this would perfectly explain why we see different characteristics in human beings today. As people would move into different regions of the earth, they would have, of course, experienced radically different climates. Some where the sun beat down almost constantly and somewhere that was cold. There would be different geographic barriers. There would be different food sources that would influence them. But what you really see as people move off into groups and they then begin to breed as subpopulations within themselves, that the different breeding populations, as the biologists would call them, begin to express certain recessive genetic traits, and they build up unique genetic mutations in the DNA that they're passing along from parent to child, from parent to child, from parent to child. And so we see this in other species, We see species take dogs, for example, that have been isolated in Australia and the dingoes look very differently from the wild dogs which have been isolated in Africa, which might look different still from wolves that were tamed and domesticated in Europe, etc. And why would these dogs, which all would have ultimately come from the same canine, why do they look so radically different? Now today, of course, we have sort of force bred dogs to bring out certain traits so that dogs today show probably even more varied characteristics than they naturally would. 
But even in a natural setting, again, we've seen it with dogs, we've seen it with birds, we've seen it with monkeys. If you isolate a population and they begin to show a recessive trait, red hair instead of brown or black hair, for example, and that becomes the dominant, and all of a sudden it's the majority trait in this group, while it's a very recessive, very minority trait in another group, and they begin to have genetic mutations that cause them. So one has a genetic mutation that causes them to grow, but there's food sources there that allow for them to grow taller and to be bigger. Others have a genetic mutation that causes them to grow some, but the food sources won't allow for it. And so those individuals end up not surviving as long and shorter statured individuals. There's just a million things that can happen with genetic mutations that can begin to make populations look different. Now, they don't change the population. Dogs are still dogs and birds are still birds and humans are still humans, but it absolutely changes the characteristics that you see, characteristics in things like skin color, hair color, eye color, stature, everything can be influenced by what we would call genetic drift and environmental pressures. And so what we see today, this diversity of characteristics, we would absolutely have expected to see in humans because again, we've seen it in birds, we've seen it in dogs, we've seen it in monkeys, we've seen it in horses. So you would absolutely expect that as these people went, into their separate geographies and began to breed among themselves as a distinct subpopulation, you would expect very much for those breeding populations, again, influenced by genetic drift and influenced by environmental pressures to begin to look differently. And I will make a side note here to close out. Really, the Bible does not say that there are different races of people in the New Testament in fact, goes to some great lengths to talk about that Jesus broke down that wall. It talks about between Jew and Greek, that Jesus broke down the wall. It says that within the church, there isn't Jew and Greek circumcised or uncircumcised barbarians or Scythians. The Bible, the New Testament especially, goes to great length to say, do not see race, do not focus on race. You are Christians now. You're not Latino or Asian or black. So the Bible really says, to the degree that there are ethnic differences, I would prefer you ignore them and focus on the fact that you're all believers in Christ. But really, the Bible speaks of clans. The Bible speaks of nations. The Bible speaks of different tribes, those who speak different languages or different tongues. So it may not even be accurate to say that we see different races today. We're all probably still one human race, but definitely human races that have divided up into different tribes, human races that are in different clans, that come from different sovereign nations, that speak different languages. That's probably true, but it may not be accurate to say race. But to answer the question, why do we see so many different races today if everybody descended from the same two people it's because of Genesis 10 and Genesis 11, and then the effects of genetic pool, genetic drift, environmental pressures, etc., that would have caused the variations. And what we would say is race, and what the Bible would really say are people from different clans, nations, and languages. Thanks for listening. Until next time, this is Andy.